So, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to EXSU and SIS seminar series. So, today we have one student presenter and a poll will appear at the end of the presentation. Please fill it up for us. So, the student presenter is Alina Hamburger, who has finished her bachelor's honors degree in biology at Queen's University and currently a PhD candidate at McGill. She is supervised by Dr. Rosinski and co-supervised by Dr. Huglin. And today, her topic of presentation is targeting senescent cells using synolytics to prevent breast-to-bone metastasis. So over to you, Elena. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Perfect. So, uh, hi everybody. My name is Eliane Hamburger. Thank you for the introduction. I'm in the uh, laboratories of Dr. Rosenzweig and Dr. Hagland, PhD student. And today I'll be talking about using senolytic drugs as a possible combination treatment with chemotherapy in order to prevent metastasis in the bone. So not so much AI, but uh, a bit of an interesting topic to start with. So some statistics, approximately 1.5 million women are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. 2.5% of these women upon diagnosis have bone involvement. And because we have such great interventions in place, uh, these women are living longer, meaning that 15% of these patients who don't already have bone involvement will in fact end up with bone metastasis in the next 15 years, which we'd like to prevent. So we're thinking that possibly can senolytics be used in combination with chemo in order to prevent breast to bone metastasis. So why is this relevant? 50% of Canadians are expected to develop cancer in their life. And it's been estimated that about 50% of US patients dying annually with solid tumor cancers actually do have bone involvement. So there's something there to look into. And spine metastasis is very common from patients with primary breast cancer, especially now with patients living longer. And we think that, uh, in a sense, chemotherapy, we know, causes a lot of stress on the body, but in fact will induce a senescence environment within and surrounding the primary tumor, which can lead to immunosuppression and therapy resistance. And this project may result in a novel strategy in order to combat metastatic disease. So let's uh, talk about senescence for a moment for those of you who have not seen me present before. So let's say you have a primary tumor and you treat it with chemotherapy. And what you get is a chemotherapeutic stress where you induce senescence within and surrounding the tumor. So for those of you who don't know, senescent cells are non-dividing cells. Now, at first we thought maybe that's not so bad for cancer because if it's not dividing, the cancer is not growing. However, what research has found is that senescent cells, when in accumulation, adopt a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Now, that sounds quite extravagant, but really what it means is they're releasing immunofactors, which cause chronic inflammation in the body, which is not so great when you have cancer, promotion of angiogenesis, which is the blood supply to the, to the tumor, and promotion of cell migration as well as evasion. So what do you get with that? Tumor growth and metastasis. So we hypothesize that combining senolytics, which are drugs that specifically target the senescent cells and not normal dividing cells, with the standard chemo, in our case, doxorubicin for triple negative breast cancer, will diminish tumor size, outgrowth, and SASP release. So first objective. So we wanted to investigate, of course, <clears throat> if in an in vitro tumor microenvironment model, do we actually see an increase of senescence with chemo chemotherapeutic treatment. So we created this 3D spheroid model where we took cancer cell line, tagged it with GFP, surrounded it with a collagen type gel and primary spine osteoblasts from patients. And what we found was that if we treated this metastasis model with doxorubicin, we do in fact see a rise of senescence accumulating both in the mimicked primary tumor and the stromal environment. So what's the next thing to do is look at the senolytics, right? So we have two senolytics that we're using, ovanillin, which is a natural anti-inflammatory, readily available, similar in a sense to the way that curcumin works in a lot of different cancer research, 
and RG7112, which actually was originally a chemotherapeutic of its own, especially for leukemic, uh, leuke patients with leukemia. And we're actually reintroducing it here at very, very low concentrations just to be used as a senolytic. So what we're doing is we're combining them with the doc service and treatment and seeing, you know, are we reducing senescence? Are we stopping the tumor outgrowth? Everything that I mentioned in our hypothesis. So what we're looking at here on the top of the page is GFP labeled cancer cells. Now, what you see in the control group is the gel in the periphery, um, because we're on the GFP channel, we're not looking at the osteoblast, but they're embedded in this gel. And you can see if you let the tumor grow for 21 days with no treatment, that the cells actually take up almost the entire 3D complex. Now with chemotherapeutic treatment, <clears throat> doxorubicin is a standard treatment for cancer. So we expect a 50% reduction in activity, outgrowth, et cetera. And we see this visually here in the center image. <clears throat> and what we're experimenting with is, of course, the addition of the senolytics, where you see here in the third image, you almost see no more cancer cells um, with fluorescence here. So we wanted to make sure that it's not just affecting fluorescence, but in fact, that we're reducing the senescence population. So you can see <clears throat> on the bottom half of the page, that not just in the cancer cells are we reducing senescence, but also in the periphery, right? So we induced senescence in both the cancer and the periphery with doxorubicin, but when you add the senolytics, we've removed those cells, as well as reducing metabolic activity, which is good for our mimicked metastasis model. Now, another way to visualize this, of course, is you can create surface plots with these images and you can track the fluorescence activity as well as the proliferation. So if you can see here, as we expect, proliferation is about knocked off 50% with doxorubicin and further significantly reduced with the triple combination. Now, what do we expect from this? Well, we've seen that chemotherapy with doxorubicin does in fact induce a population of senescence within and surrounding a mimicked tumor model. Adding senolytics to the chemo treatment can reduce overall metabolic activity, growth, and evasion, again, as seen in vitro. And the strategy may be affected, effective in preventing further skeletal metastasis in patients with breast cancer but not just breast cancer, right? So we see spine metastasis in patients from primary cancers from breast, kidney, prostate, lung, ovarian, et cetera. So we do want to see if we can screen these therapeutics with models with those primary cancers as well and do all that before moving on to in vivo studies with these drugs. So I want to leave you off with some relevance again to bone health. Why did we choose the spine? So again, uh, as breast to spine, especially. Uh, so 84,600 Canadian patients are dying annually from cancer-related causes, 7% from breast cancer alone. Skeletal metastasis is very common in breast cancer patients, especially now with proper intervention where patients are living for a longer amount of time. And these metastatic lesions are very painful. So they're causing mechanical strength reduction, function of the spine is reduced, people are bedridden, et cetera, and it's uh, quite debilitating for patients. And we propose that, in fact, chemotherapy-induced cell senescence is linked to secondary tumor growth and metastasis within the spine. So uh, thank you for your time and patience, and uh, thank you to all of my lab mates for working on this with me and uh, all of the funding that we have in place to continue our work. Thank you so much, Alina. So, do you, uh, do anyone has any questions? Yes, uh, Miranda. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I was just wondering um, why you chose to use triple negative breast cancers, since triple negative tend to metastasize only to the brain, liver, and um, lungs, as opposed to uh, estrogen receptor positive, which make up the majority of uh, metastasis to the bone. So why did you choose triple negative as opposed to uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, so we are looking at a myriad of breast cancer types actually. So MCF7, um, we're looking at uh, MDA453, we're looking at MDA231s and uh, a few others. So 
exactly what you said. We wanted to check first to see with the senolytic specifically how it's affecting different types of breast cancer. So we started with one and we actually do have a few um, instances where this type of cancer has gone to the spine. So again, as you say, maybe it's a little bit more rare, so we should branch out and exactly we are. And uh, we also are really, really looking to see how, because these senolytics are so new, we wanna see how they affect different cancers. So different types of breast cancer, we're also looking at uh, colon cancer, ovarian, kidney, lung, and you know, really like that experimental approach where how is it affecting these type of cancers? And if it's in a bone model, how is it affecting metastasis to the spine? So it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, great answer. Yes, uh, so we have another question from Roseanne. I see you raising her hand. Okay. Uh, hello, Elena. Thank you for this uh, valuable uh, uh, lecture. Uh, just a uh, presentation. Just uh, I want, uh, according to what I understood, you uh, uh, you found that this uh, use of vanilla uh, senolytic uh, agent will reduce uh, the tumor uh, uh, growth rate. Uh, uh, in addition, they will reduce the meds to the uh, uh, spine, both of them, the, the tumor itself, growth. So great question. So you're asking if, if I understand you correctly, are the senolytics only working on the primary cancer or in fact, have we found that they yes. are preventing metastasis yes. to the spine? So it's a bit twofold if you'll give me the time to answer this question. So first we're finding in this model that we're reducing the growth. So that's from the primary tumor. Now, we're still in the works to look at the, um, uh, basically we're, lo we're looking at cytokine arrays right now. So we're looking at that SASP release that I mentioned to see if the media of these experiments actually do show all the different factors we know to be contributing to the metastasis to the spine. So that's a bit of the connection there. And we're looking actually at after a MET has been released, uh, well, not released, in, excised from the spine, if when we add treatment there, because a lot of the time you get chemo even with removing the MET from the spine, right? We want to see if the senolytics will remove more of the cells that are not being uh, removed even after a MET has been removed. So uh, it's basically adding to the efficacy of the chemotherapeutic treatment reducing inflammation at the same time. So we can start at the primary tumor, but we can also come in later with patients who already have METs in the spine, give the same treatment and hope that we can remove more of the cancer cells, whether they're senescent or not. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, the common location is spine, but uh, do you uh, search for the brain for METs? Uh, but I, I meant the METs. So uh, it's, it's a great question. So we are an orthopedic spine group. So I am specifically focused on the spine. That's not to say that this model cannot be used to screen for other patients with other places of secondary cancers. It, it'll be a viable tool with 3D modeling. So it can be used for many different types of cancer. Of course, you could look at the whole body. So we're starting very narrow and, you know, hopefully we'll see where it goes from there. Maybe next you know, the rest of the body. Great, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. And so anybody has more? Sure, questions? sure. Hi, this guy, sure. Hi, Lena. Yeah, great work, actually. Very impressive data. Um, I just have a question about the senescent cells. So where are they typically localized in the, in the solid tumor? Pardon, I, I just, you dropped off a bit at the end there. Oh, sorry. Where, where are the senescent cells localized in a solid tumor, typically? Oh, in the tumor? Yeah. Uh, it's everywhere. So uh, it's as everywhere? we, okay. yeah. So that's, that's the, that's a big issue is when they start to accumulate, it's not just in one space. It, we really see it's everywhere. And actually what we're focusing on now is that it's a systemic problem. And because mm -hmm. chemo is given systemically, we're seeing senescence increase throughout the body. And if we can actually give a systemic treatment of the senolytics, maybe we can reduce inflammation elsewhere. So we have, of course, colleagues, if anybody knows with Dr. Haglund's group, they're looking at senescence in the spine because of disc degeneration. So of course, if you have 
more senescence, it's also related to aging and other diseases that are debilitating. So we want to we wanna get rid of all that. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually a problem of throughout the body that we're targeting. Hopefully. I mean, so. it's a big, uh, a big take. <laughs> no, on. it's great. Yeah. It's a great approach, actually. Uh, a second question, is this the delivery? Have you thought about the delivery since um, these types of drugs, at least the ovanolin, is somewhat hydrophobic? Is there like a special delivery that you need that you're going to go in vivo? Um, so uh, with my other lab, actually, they do have animal studies going for the spine specifically, and they give oral gavage for the senolytics. Okay. And uh, right now I'm also working on because it's actually a big question, senolytics, how are we going to give it? Can it be at the same time? Does it have to be sort of spaced with the chemo? And so mm -hmm. that's what we're working on now. So we're looking at, do we give the chemotherapy first, wait, and then follow with senolytics, et cetera? Or can we give it in one go? So far, we've been giving it together, but we're seeing maybe if we space it, do we get better results, et cetera? So it's, it's part of the experiment. This is pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty yeah. pleasant. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for answering the questions. Well, thank you so much. And good luck. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question, Mike. And if do we have any more questions? So if not, then I will say thank you so much, Eliane. Thank you. I like the it's great work, great presentation. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much. And I would like to introduce our graduate program director, Dr. Foxen Molly, professor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Muskan. Uh, Elaine, that was a really great work, uh, wonderful. Um, so we wanted to start with uh, something that's been uh, ubiquitous. You all hear AI, everywhere you go, there's AI. You go to sleep, you hear AI. So, <laughs> So we wanted to uh, start with this uh, really uh, one excellent uh, topic. And we are thankful to have uh, Ms. Amanda Whitley and Ms. Sandy Javier, who are going to talk to us about using AI tools uh, for research. Uh, so Ms. Amanda Whitley is a liaison uh, librarian for management, business and entrepreneurship, outreach and engagement coordinator uh, at McGill. She's also the project manager um, at, at the library uh, website uh, design. And we're going to add Ms. Sandy Javier is the head of the uh, Nahum Gelba Law, Law Library, uh, virtual reference coordinator uh, at McGill Libraries. So just a background, Ms. Amanda, uh, uh, basically, uh, she also manages the, the website design. Uh, also, as we say, uh, the research primarily explores how artificial intelligence intersects with the uh, library user interface uh, services. Of course, she focuses on AI tools and user information uh, to look at uh, behavior. And uh, Ms. Hevier, um is both, uh, works both in traditional and virtual environment with a particular interest in augmenting this process uh, using uh, AI. So without further ado, uh, Ms. Amanda Whitley, please. Hi, thank you so much for having us today. I'm just gonna get my screen set up. Sandy, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect, there you are. Okay, awesome. Okay. Can you turn up your volume? It's a little low for me. Oh, you can't, you can't hear me? Not super clearly. Okay. Um, hold on, let me see if I can fix that. I don't know if other, for other people it's okay. Can you hear both of us? Yes. Okay, so I'll just turn up my volume, fine. There, I've turned up my microphone, so okay, I apologize if I'm too loud now. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So, Sandy, take okay. it away. All right. Um, so, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it was really interesting to hear your presentation because I had a moment this morning where I was like, what is experimental surgery exactly? Um, so, it was really interesting. Thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us today where we're going to talk about 
uh, AI tools for research. Um, so things that could potentially help you um, augment your research. Um, so you met us, um, but this is kind of what we're going to look at today. So our roadmap to research. Uh, we'll start with our AI family tree and some just very basic definitions, just to make sure everyone is kind of starting off on the same page. Um, then Amanda is going to bring us and we'll delve a little bit deeper into the resources that we can use, um, like the tools, like some demonstration of tools that could be useful. Um, then we'll talk about how to how you might want to implement AI in your research or create a research plan. Like how are you going to acknowledge the use of AI um, in the research that you're doing? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about a framework for the future. Okay, so if we start with our family tree, so first off, where do we start? Because as you mentioned, we hear a lot about AI. Um, there's a lot of definitions, there's a lot of words thrown at us in the media sometimes, so it can get a little confusing as to, okay, what exactly uh, are we talking about? So there's a few um, definitions, there's a lot of different ones, sometimes researchers come up with their own. Uh, here we have two, so one from the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, which states that AI is the capacity of computers or other machines to exhibit or simulate intelligent behavior, right? And that's something that you hear a lot in definitions like intelligence or, or simulate or learn. Um, and the other one is from Poole, Mackworth, and Goebel um, from 1998. Um, and it's still, you know, still relevant today. Um, and it really focuses on how it can be flexible to changing environments and changing goals, how it's going to learn from experience um, and acts intelligently. So that's something that comes up again and again, this like intelligent factor in AI, how it learns, how it like mimics how humans think, essentially. Um, and to help us understand this, we have a few definitions. So things that are you know, words that are often mentioned at the same time as AI, um, but can have like slightly different meanings. So you probably heard a lot about like machine learning. It's coming up a lot in the news because of different systems that use this. Um, it's usually thought of as a subset of AI. Some people think of it as its own kind of discipline, if you will. Um, and it uses, um, like it teaches computers how to learn and act without being explicitly programmed. So there's not a human telling it, like, if this happens, do this. Um, it's more like an algorithm um, is going to tell it, okay, like, based on all of these factors, this is the response to this situation. Um, so it's really trying to make predictions, essentially. Um, that's something you see a lot with, like, Chad GPT, for example, right? Like, it's trying to predict the answer that you want. So machine learning um, is really based on the construction of those algorithms um, that will adapt like models uh, to hopefully be better at making predictions. And then if we go like kind of even further in depth under machine learning, and you'll see this in our graph in a minute, we have something called deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. And this one really avoids the need for a human operator to formally specify all the knowledge that the computer needs. So there's not a person saying it, saying, oh, you have to know all these things. Let me program all these things into you. Um, it's really more based on a hierarchy of concepts that will enable the computer to learn like, complicated concepts, right? So that's why we can see it's even more in depth than machine learning um, because it's kind of like building blocks, right? So it's gonna build more complex concepts um, out of simpler ones. Again, without the person having to tell it, you know, this is what this means. Okay, um, and you can see a great visual, visual representation that Amanda made. Um, so you have like all, you know, artificial intelligence, that's kind of the big umbrella term, and all of the related terms that we just mentioned, like machine learning, deep learning, like we have robotics on the side. Um, then if we go to the other side, we'll have things like natural language processing and text generation. So again, things that, you know, tools like ChatGPT, which you've probably heard a lot about. 
uh, will use because they're, you know, using that to parse out the questions we're asking it and also generating answers. Um, and you can see like the difference, like speech to text, for example, or image recognition or computer vision um, that's used in self-driving cars. So you can see that it's a it's a really big, um, it's a plethora of different kind of technologies um, and subtypes of AI. So sometimes people use them interchangeably, but they're very much, you know, AI is kind of the big umbrella at the top. And then you have like the specific subtypes underneath it. Okay. So before we get started with the demonstration of some of the tools we'll show you today, what are some AI tools that you actually use? So I mentioned ChatGPT, but there's there's others. Um, there's a lot of our day-to-day -day tools that we use that have AI components in them. Um, things like Netflix, for example. Um, so if you want to, you know, put in the chat maybe a few of the tools that you think use AI um, or that you know use AI. We'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, some people is mentioning Prime Video, Autopilot. Yes, I've seen that before. Um, email writing, some specific tools, ChatGPT. Yes, very useful. Um, some image generation. Sorry, Amanda, what were you saying? I was just reading the, the deep dream generator for images. That's yeah. really cool. Grammarly, yeah, that's a really good example. Dali as well for images. Yeah, so we have a pretty like varied um, tools here, like some, some text generation and some, you know, other tools that are just like incorporated in our every day. Someone's mentioning Elicit, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, great, thank you everyone. So I will turn it over to Amanda now. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some of the tools that we can use for the information seeking process. Um, so I'm actually going to skip over this question um, just to start. So one of the things I kind of want to start off is a little bit of an anecdote. This is something that happens a lot in libraries and is a story I like to share, especially around this like AI conversation. Um, so when we're in library school, one of the fun ways that we get trained is with these really obscure, vague questions. Uh, you might have heard jokes around these before. Um, I'm looking for a book. I don't remember what the title was, but the cover was red, the cover was blue, the cover was purple, something like that, uh, where there's no other information given uh, except for this. And we now have to parse this out. And this is actually something that I learned how to do was that if a patron came to me and they could only tell me one small thing, what were the steps that I needed to take in order to find the answer to their question and the correct answer to their question? So this is something that we learned to do as humans. And so this brings us to three different types of common questions that we get that are also understood by artificial intelligence programs. So text-based and oral questions, these are questions where we can actually break down searchable terms. Uh, so this is very familiar to like Boolean logic searching, where we have exact terms that we need to put into a search engine and it is going to pull out that kind of context for us. There are also world knowledge questions. These are questions that have obvious answers um, or that can be parsed uh, from their answers based off of perhaps a consensus. Uh, and so actually that's a little hint. One of the tools we're gonna look at later is called consensus, which does some of this world knowledge parsing. And then there are unanswerable questions, like the cover was read. These are questions that uh, do not have enough uh, keywords generated into them. They're usually a little too semantic, a little too colloquial for a search engine or a person to be able to pick up. And so you need more context for these types of things. And what a lot of these information uh, AI tools are trying to do is kind of bridge these unanswerable questions with the text-based world knowledge questions. They're trying to kind of fold all of this together so that you can search in a in a really direct way that you don't need to have to do the structured type of searching that you had to do in the past. So the way that we do that is through semantic searching. And so I said a little bit about how traditional searching uses a lot of that Boolean logic. So the and, the ors, the nots, uh, all the structured truncation that you might be familiar with when you're doing your literature reviews. Um, this is really important to the way that our, our library databases and our journal databases are currently set up because that's how they're pulling out 
that kind of information. But what we're seeing now is this new type of search layer, a new type of discovery layer that is using semantic language to try and pull out search results. And so these are getting really quite popular. So we're going to look at uh, a few of them. We're going to start with Semantic Scholar. I'm going to show uh, Research Rabbit. We're going to look at Elicit and then finally Consensus. And we'll talk a little bit about ChatGPT as well. Um, all right. So Semantic Scholar. The reason I like to start with this is that Semantic Scholar is kind of where everything can be traced to in the AI uh, space, although it's quickly kind of becoming uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT now. Um, but Semantic Scholar, uh, this was created uh, basically to be a almost competitor to Google Scholar. It's supposed to help uh, scientists, researchers uh, find articles in a more colloquial manner so that they don't have to do that structured type of searching anymore. Um, what's really great about it is that it actually pulls up abstracts, tables, and figures in the search results in a way that Google Scholar does not. So that was kind of a little bit of their claim to fame. And then you could also build collections of the articles that you were looking to read, and it was going to suggest you content based off of the collections that you build. So I'll take a quick second here and show you Semantic Scholar. If you haven't used this before, uh, you can see we have our uh, base interface here, and we can go in and we can type in, in stuff pretty quickly. I'm just going to use public health as my term today. Um, so we have over 9 uh, million results for public health. Uh, but what I want to show is some of these search results here. If we are to select them, you can see that I can come in here. I get a little bit of my figures. I get the citations, references, related papers. Um, if it's available, you'll also get an abstract. And so that's where we're getting a really different interface from Google Scholar. Um, and now, like I said, if you go in here, if you create an account, you can start collecting your papers. You can save them to your library. It's going to generate and like recommend content for you based off of what you're using. Um, but another really important thing that I like to point out with Semantic Scholar is that if we scroll down to the bottom, um, in this footer section here under research, uh, they also share publications, their researchers, their prototypes, their resources. Um, we also have uh, in their about section, their publishers. So these are sections that I like to go to, to see uh, in terms of publications, what they're currently working on and in terms of publishers who they're currently working with. Um, so this is really important if you want to know what kind of papers are going to show up in your search result. Uh, so if we go into Semantic Scholar Publishers, you can see this is a list of all of the different places that they're scraping for their search results. Now, we don't get this with Google Scholar. Google is not telling us who they're scraping. We don't have that information. Uh, we can assume it's just about everything that's out there. Um, and when it's Google Scholar, we can assume it's all the scholarly content. Uh, but we don't get a list of publishers that are being worked with. We can only kind of go off of their publications and what they're releasing in the information that they're publishing. But what's really great about this is we have this list of publishers. Now, the reason I want to start with Semantic Scholar is that as we start to get into all of these other tools, uh, I'm going to pull this back up, like Research Rabbit, for instance, uh, you'll notice that um, on all of these slides, it's going to have a little disclaimer that these tools are using Semantic Scholar as their backend. Uh, search interface. So Research Rabbit is just yet another product that is claiming to be your AI powered scientific paper generator. They're trying to better connect you with research. I think at one point their tagline was that they were like the Spotify of research papers. They were going to have all these curated collections for you based on what you were reading. Uh, so that was kind of their, their thing. Um, but when we go into these, so I'm going to open up Research Rabbit. Uh, this one is actually free. Uh, for you to have a subscription to. So if anyone is interested, uh, there's a free version here. So I'm just going to log in to mine and show. Um, so we have our categories here. I'm going to create a new collection for today. We're going to call this experimental surgery. And so when you go in to start your work uh, in Research Rabbit, Research Rabbit is a very visual based uh, information, um, information seeking platform or, or search engine, however you want to think of it. Um, it's going to lay out everything out in, in these different uh, columns um, and kind of show you the connections between them all. Uh, so when you start to add your papers, uh, I'm going to do, again, a quick search here for public health. 
Um, and before I uh, hit enter, it's asking me if I would like to search through PubMed or if I would like to search through Semantic Scholar. Um, so one of the things that is kind of important to know here is that these two, PubMed and Semantic Scholar, are the most popular backend search engines for all of these AI tools. Elicit uses Semantic Scholar, Cite, Semantic Scholar, Connected Papers, Semantic Scholar. They are all pulling from them. Some of them also pull from PubMed as well, uh, but not every single one. And you can't search both at once. You have to search one through PubMed and once again through Semantic Scholar. That's the way that the, the interface works. Um, so I'm going to do my Semantic Scholar search here. If I did want to go back, I would just have to click my biomedical and life sciences category, and that would switch me to a PubMed search. Um, but now we're using the, the uh, research Robert algorithm. So I'm just going to add some of these papers here at random, which is probably not really helping my AI collection because <laughs> uh, you want to be a little bit more uh, specific when you're adding these. Uh, but what I'd like to show is that the start here is that essentially we're adding papers. You can also add papers that you already know, um, that, that you already know of. So if you have the DOI of a paper that you want to start with, a Z paper, if you use Zotero, you can actually connect your Zotero library directly to Research Rabbit, which is really cool. So it helps you input and output your papers, which is really nice. Um, but once you have a seed paper in here, the first thing that you're going to see is if you click on it, it's going to start to suggest some similar work. So we have 1,800 plus papers here. We also have all the references and citations for this paper. And then we have other work that these authors or suggested authors uh, might be looking at. And so when I'm looking at one individual paper, I can click that similar work and it's recommending similar papers, again, for this one specific paper. But if I close this out and I go back, and I look at my category as a whole, I'm gonna turn on both of these. I'm going to try to generate connected work for all of these papers. It's gonna to try to suggest for me new papers that are based off of the collection as a whole. And as I go, I'm gonna go back into that similar work. I'm going to click on different categories. Say I like this, I can add this to my, my experimental surgery collection. I'll add another. So every paper that I add, I'm telling Research Rabbit that this is the direction that I'd like to go with my research. And I would like to see similar work that is suggested based off of the common themes of all of these papers. So as you build your collection, it's going to start to get more and more precise uh, with the similar work that it recommends. Ideally, this number should get lower and lower as you go because you're getting more refined with your paper. Right now, I'm kind of just throwing <laughs> a little bit of everything into here, so it's not going to have the best suggestions. Uh, but what's really great is that once you have um, all of your work, say you wanted to say you loved all of these, uh, all of the similar work here, um, and you wanted to check out everything later, you want it to save it, uh, you can see that you can actually pull out export papers through BibTeX, through R, uh, RIS, and through a CSV file. So if you do the RIS file, uh, you can input that directly into EndNote or into Zotero. And so I see the question here, can we sync with EndNote? So it's not a direct sync with EndNote, but if you export through RIS, then you can just take that file and add it directly into your EndNote library. And then if you, again, export from EndNote, your RIS file, upload your RIS into here. You can do that. It's just Zotero has that direct connection, so you don't have to do that intermediary step if you connect your Zotero. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So where are they? So the RIS file there, you would download, you would get your list. Uh, the one thing that I will mention is that when you are downloading um, the RIS file, it only downloads the first 50 uh, papers. Uh, so if you notice, if you scroll down, there's only 50 at a time. So you just have to hit this load more button. Ideally, you're not going to be downloading 1800 papers at a time. It'll probably only be like maybe like 50 to 100 or something like that. Uh, so when you do that, um, you would just hit the load more button, scroll down, and everything that's loaded is is what is going to be exported. So just to note when you're doing your export to hit that load more button if you need to go beyond 50. Um, other things that you're going to see in here. So like I mentioned, this is a really visual platform so that we have these connections between all of our authors. So we can see um, how these authors are connected to each other, if they're working with each other, um, if they're um, either citing or if they are um, 
uh, co-authors on papers, we're going to see those relationships. So if we want to see a specific group of researchers and the work that they're doing and how they're connected with each other, that's really what that graph is representing. Um, and I see that we have a hand up. There's a question. Please go ahead and unmute. Oh, Trisha? Marcia, do you want to ask? Yeah, I, I wrote it in the chat, actually. Uh, you mentioned it or mentioned it already. I just wanted to see what is the, uh, what would be the graph, actually, what's the graph showing us? And you mentioned it's uh, like the connection or common citation between the authors? Yeah. Yeah, so if we were to start clicking on these, so this is, uh, we're clicking on our one paper here, and so we're seeing the graph is showing us the connections between the different papers, so usually it's co-authors or citations, uh, so if we were to click on, like, say, all references or citations, for example, uh, the graph is going to show us those representations between those citations and who cited each other, um, who's worked with each other, uh, so that's really what we're seeing here with the graph. Thanks. All right, I'm going to assume that the hand raise is perhaps in, not a hand, and we'll just continue. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the core of what Research Rabbit is, uh, as I mentioned, is that we're, we're building papers, we're going off here on the side. The more that we click through, you'll notice that you'll have this kind of dynamic dashboard here. Um, so if you are someone who likes to see your papers visually laid out, if you if you like that kind of graphic re representation, Research Rabbit is definitely one that you want to uh, kind of gravitate towards. Um, it's really useful in that regard. I myself am not a visual person, so I prefer to have <laughs> have my uh, content laid out a little bit differently. Uh, so I like to use connected papers or uh, site or illicit, which tend to not be as, as visual. Uh, but I li really like Research Rabbit um, just because of the fact that it is has a um, very good free subscription to it, whereas other uh, uh, other platforms do not. So I've also opened up Illicit, and I noticed that somebody in the chat had mentioned they were working with Illicit before. Now, Illicit Connected Paper Site, um, all of these different tools are doing a very similar thing to Research Rabbit. So I'm not going to spend too much time showing that. But what I did want to show was uh, kind of just some of the pricing features on here so that you can see what it's offering. Uh, is this kind of credit setup. So you can do a free version of Illicit. Um, and the only reason I can't go into mine now is that I've used all my credits. <laughs> so you get a base set of credits and this is going to allow you to search for papers, to extract papers. It's going to allow you to basically interact with the platform. And the more that you do that, the more credits that you spend. And then once you hit your 5,000 credits, uh, you now have to move into the paid tier. Um, so the paid tier, it starts at $10 USD a month. So it's not super pro cost prohibitive, uh, depending on, on your financial situation. Maybe if you have grant funding that you are able to use for something like this, uh, you can put it towards a subscription. Or maybe your lab wants to come in together on, on a subscription for your group. There's also options to do like enterprise for teams or companies. Uh, so you can always reach out to them to see what sort of options they have for that. Um, and that's what a lot of these, these do as well. Um, but even then, you're still usually dealing with a, a set of credits, so uh, so many searches, so many interactions that you can do per month. Um, the other thing that I like to point out is that Elicit is backed by Semantic Scholar as well. So Research Rabbit, uh, Research Rabbit, Elicit, they're all using Semantic Scholar. So if you did want to use something free that doesn't have necessarily like that fancy interface, you could just go back to Semantic Scholar, sign in, create your account for free, and use this, build your library in here. Um, what each of these companies is offering is a different algorithm that's trying to suggest papers for you. So you're really just getting the different suggestions based off of your collection. That's really, it's the, the algorithms changing from site to site based off of those things. But the back end of what is being fed to you in terms of papers, what papers are available, is what is in Semantic Scholar. Um, so that's kind of important. Uh, 
Um, so two other tools um, that I want to talk about, uh, Chad GPT, obviously, and then consensus, because consensus is a little bit different. We've been looking at more uh, kind of strict paper um, recommendations and generation in, in kind of that regard. Consensus is something that I see uh, happening a lot more in the health sciences field. Uh, it's designed to uh, be a search engine that pulls the answers to questions, to like world knowledge type questions. So if you haven't used it before, um, it's really quite neat. You go in and you ask a question. Again, really uh, colloquial type type questions. You can see here um, some of the examples. Does creatine help build muscle? Can mindfulness improve sleep? Uh, they are also doing um, economics questions like does direct cash transfers reduce poverty? So they've got these really, really um, broad opening kind of uh, examples to really let you know that you don't have to use very scientific specific language. Uh, we can just kind of ask um, does sparkling water um, hurt your teeth? And now it's going to synthesize. All right. So what essentially it is doing here is it is going through the scientific literature and it is looking for the answer to whether or not sparkling water is good or bad for your teeth uh, based off of the results from these papers. And so the consensus is that there's about 60% possibility that sparkling water could be bad for my teeth. If you just wanted something, like if you just wanted a really quick look at something uh, of an area to see where people are leaning in like sort of that consensus meter, what direction things are going in, this is a really nice way to get that. Um, but what's really cool is that if we search down here, we're also getting those recommended papers. So these are all of the papers that it used to find the answer to my question. Um, and then from there, you can kind of go and say, OK, were these good papers? Were these papers that I would use? Um, and you can create an account. You can kind of save those filters or save those um, save those uh, papers. And then it's going to recommend you more content the same way that everything else does. But its claim to fame is this initial kind of summary and consensus meter. Um, and I see that the question here, does Semantic Scholar also show results from PubMed? Um, I don't believe they do. Uh, oh, they do. Sorry, actually, I was wrong about that. Um, PubMed is filtered in through Semantic Scholar. Yes. Um, but I think that would be... It's, it's interesting because PubMed is also a um, like search interface. So I'd be curious to know what kind of relationship Semantic Scholar has with PubMed. This is one of those things where I would be going to look more at their publications to kind of figure out how they're working together because PubMed is also scraping through a lot of these papers in order to pull that up into their search interface. So um, I'd be curious to know a little bit more about what their relationship is like and how that kind of works um, because they're really more kind of like similar products as opposed to one that can feed into the other. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic. Um, but they're not always very clear about that on their website. You just have to do a lot of digging to find out the answers to those questions. Um, all right. Uh, excuse me, I was uh, wondering uh, the difference between PubMed and uh, Semantic Scholar. As you said, as a Semantic Scholar is based on AI machine, uh, it is easier to, uh, to search with that because uh, I knew, I heard that uh, we should use some uh, symbols and different characters and have a um, another search algorithm using PubMed. But here we don't need to, uh, that. Am I right? Yeah. So PubMed is also has an AI filter to its search interface. So. Um, the, I think you would want to stay in PubMed for more control. Um, Semantic Scholar is really designed to kind of, like, like what they're trying to do with their AI layer is say that you don't need to have that amount of control because the AI is going to do that work for you. PubMed is kind of in an in-between space where you have a lot of control with your search, but they're also implementing these new AI um, like search layers to them that are trying to do some of that work for you. Um, so. 
in the sense where if you're doing something like really systematic, if you're doing like a knowledge synthesis, for example, and you need that kind of direct control, you want to stick with like a PubMed type interface. Um, if you're doing just like a base literature review, if you're trying to get a sense of what's out there, if you're trying to build your collection of things that you should be looking at, if you're trying to like expand your own kind of, uh, kind of knowledge set, then I feel like Semantic Scholar is really good for helping find those outside things, if, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much. Um, awesome. Any other questions while we're we're here? Uh, yes, Amanda. Uh, which, which is uh, uh, what are, uh, are the differences between Google Scholar and the Semantic uh, uh, Scholar? Yeah. So um, with Semantic Scholar, the big thing that they're kind of pushing is that. Um, well, one, their AI algorithm in recommending you papers, uh, but what is really a bit more unique with them is the ability to pull out the figures in the abstract. So again, if I do my base search here, um, we all, we also have a little bit more control. So you can, uh, in Semantic Scholar, you can filter by field of study. You can filter by um, PDF inclusion right away. You can also filter by specific journals or conferences. We don't have that control with Google Scholar. Um, so we're getting a little bit more functionality in our filters to start with, which is, which is good. And then if we click on here, we're also getting the figures. Sometimes we get uh, the tables as well. If there's figures, tables, abstracts that are are included with the paper, uh, those are going to be in the search results as well, which we don't get with Google Scholar. We have to open up every single thing individually uh, and, and review it. Um, so that is, I think, the big benefit of why people use Semantic Scholar over Google Scholar isn't always necessarily the AI algorithm. It's more the amount of control you get with the filter and the information that's being presented to you. It helps kind of cut down that time. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. So I'll also uh, excuse me. My... Oh, sorry. It seems like Research Rabbit, um, since it's um, like it's doing the job of the semantic uh, thing, and it's allowing us to uh, get more suggestions. So maybe it's better if we want to do this, um, you know, benefit from the AI research and benefit from the suggestions that are given to uh, like um, narrow. In, it helps us into narrowing our research more. So that's uh, based. That's what I have. Uh, I don't know if I'm correct or not. But that's no, why. I think that's a, a really good takeaway from this. And honestly, I think a lot of it comes down to, to your personal interface with the experiment, like whether you're working with Elicit, which is much more laid out um, kind of line by line in the papers that it's representing to you, um, whereas Research Rabbit is a lot more visual. All of them are using Semantic Scholar as your back end. So I think what it comes down to for a lot of people is your personal preference in interface in what you're experimenting with. And then also just the general results, the user experience that you're getting from each of these tools. Um, really the choice then becomes up to you of, of which you like interacting with more. But because they're all using that same back end, um, you're getting the same, you're searching from the same subset. So you can kind of be sure that like it's it comes down to personal experience. Thank you. Yeah, so that's uh, really wonderful. Um, so one of the things I've been uh, a, a little bit worried about is the credibility and quality of the papers. Uh, uh, so does Semantic uh, Scholar provide information about peer review status of the research papers? So they don't provide necessarily information about peer review status, but if we go back to the publisher's page, uh, you can see that they're pulling in content from a lot of different places. A lot of these are like archive.org, uh, MedArchive, BioArchive. Um, so these are places where a lot of people might be putting up preprints that have, so versions that have not gone through peer review, they might be putting up uh, submitted manuscript versions of their papers. So these could get pulled into a search algorithm. So the responsibility is still with the researcher to look at where this paper is coming from, if this is still something that they would naturally include in that literature 
review or include in their work. So just because we're using an AI filter to find all of the content in one place, uh, we still have to be information literate professionals. We still have to apply that that kind of skill. Um, so that part isn't kind of lost. We still have to do that work. Right. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm they, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, uh, uh, according to what Prof. Faxon uh, uh, mentioned, which one the best to uh, to have this uh, evaluation of the paper or uh, uh, review? Um, I've seen ones like because that's the thing is a lot of them the majority of just kind of what they're going to tell you is like the journal of where it's coming from. Um, like they're giving you that basic metadata information. There are some like consensus where it's going to claim that it's like summarizing the content and that the, the but really what's happening is that they're summarizing the paper, but they're not summarizing necessarily the quality of the peer review of the paper. They're really just summarizing the text, right? So when you get um, different tools that are doing that, that are providing you with summaries and you think, oh, this is really great. I'm getting summaries of all the text that I need to read. So I don't have to read, you know, a 30 page paper anymore. I can kind of skip that step. Well, you can't because you can't necessarily trust that it's pulling out the right things. You still have to do the level of, is this the right journal? Um, does this make sense? What you're really getting is more of a convenience layer and helping you find that content. We're not at a stage yet where you can say, okay, it is summarize these top five papers. These must be the top five papers. It's doing a peer review analyst on them. It's not. It's literally just going out and looking for like the full text to see which text matches the questions and the prompts that you're putting in. Uh, so the onus is still on us to do that, that background work. Um, so even if they're, if they claim that they're doing that, I still would not trust that. That's a very good point, actually. Yeah. Uh, um... In this example with the bottled water, like the, the articles that say yes could be those of lower peer review status versus the ones that say possibly, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you still have to, to put in the, the time and kind of go through each of these, see where they're coming from. Um, all, all of those basic information literacy skills, we still have to keep working mm -hmm. on. Right. Any other questions about, about this? I also want to make sure I have time. Sandy's got this really great um, AI acknowledgement plan to kind of showcase how you can uh, start acknowledging this work in your research as well. So I want to make sure that we leave time to go over that too. But if anyone else has any other questions. Okay. So the last thing I'll touch on here is... Um, just chat GPT. So one thing that I'll kind of say, I won't go too much into this um, because I'm sure people have been told a lot about chat GPT um, and using it. Um, I've gone through both version 3.5 and I've subscribed to use version four too. So I can see kind of like the, the URLs that it's suggesting me. And really the story is kind of the same is that we've seen the cases of like fake papers uh, being generated. Uh, so if you're using it as a lit review searching tool, it's really not that powerful. It's um, really not that helpful if you're using different um, AI powered tools that are using open AI, like they're using the, the chat GPT API to generate their content, um, I would look for that in like a statement about the tool that you're using. Be very wary about the content that it's suggesting you. Make sure that you're doing, you, you know, your homework and you're checking, does this journal exist? Does this paper actually exist? Um, I'll tell you as librarians, we have gone through, um, we've gone through instances where people have reached out to us looking for articles that we've spent hours looking for only to find out that ChatGPT recommended the articles and they didn't actually exist. So there was nothing to be found. <laughs> Um, so that happens quite a lot. Um, I will also say be wary about using any of the web extensions that will offer to connect you with, um, like, like there's web extensions where you can go in and say, um, I'm going to input my prompt to ChatGPT and I want you to pull out websites or, or, or articles that only come out of PubMed, for instance. Uh, you could do that with a browser extension. Um, but oftentimes when we apply those browser extensions to our, our either Chrome or Firefox, uh, Safari, whatever it is that you're working with, you're giving full control over your browser and everything in it to these companies. There's not a lot of wiggle room for opting out. And that can be a really serious like cybersecurity risk. 
uh, so we definitely advise against that. So I would say that when it comes to chat GPT, this is really better off as just like an ideation stage to kind of figure out, you know, what is out there? How might you interact with it? Um, what are some kind of like ideas that you might spark from a specific topic or a paper? If you're trying to kind of get an idea for like a methodology that you might use, you can ask it those types of questions back and forth, but it's not really a be all end all shop for everything that you're doing. Um, and so that's kind of the, the majority of what I wanted to say here with ChatGPT. Um, and I will turn it over to Sandy make sure that we have time here to talk about implementing into our research. Hey, great. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for um, this great overview of tools. So now how do we actually use them in our research? But more, most importantly, how do we acknowledge its use in research? And we've already seen, like I saw some questions in the chat, like if I create an image using these like image generators, like how do I cite this, right? Um, and I think that's something that a lot of citation styles, you know, they don't yet have, you know, guidelines for this because it's so new. I'm sure a lot of them are pr probably contending with that. Um, so, you know, I think it's in the works. We don't have like official word yet. Uh, but what we've done is try to create like a framework to help you think of how to incorporate this in your research and some of the things that you may want to you know, consider, think about where do you want to acknowledge it? So um, if we go to our next slide. Um, so different stages where you want to think about how you're going to use AI in your research. Well, first off, is it going to be to disseminate your research? So like to share it uh, with people online. How are you going to do that? How can AI help you do that? Um, are you going to use it to find research or literature, which is a lot of the tools that we looked at today? Um, are you going to use it to conduct research itself? Like, are you going to use an AI-powered tool to help you analyze data, for example? And what could be some of the potential implications of using an AI-powered tool to do that? So, um, so if we go to our next slide, um, this is kind of a template framework uh, that we've had in the works, just like important questions to think about. Um, and if you're familiar with research data management plans, uh, which I hope you are, <laughs> because those seem to be a requirement, or um, like ethics board requests, like some of these questions are kind of based off on that or um, a kind of an expansion on that. So if you do use AI tools, um, and depending what you use them for, what are, how are you going to acknowledge the use of it, right? Because you have to say that you're using it. Um, and a lot of journals now have very strict requirements, especially in terms of using AI for authorship. Um, like a lot of journals have come out with statements saying that, you know, Chad GPT cannot be a co-author on your paper um, because authorship in our understanding of the law is assigned to a person, not a tool. So copyright is assigned to a person. So um, depending on where you use it and how, what you use it for, um, will you put it in the methods? Like if it's helping you analyze some data, that could be a good place for it, right? Like if you'd used Excel or Invivo or any other program, if you used an AI powered one, well, maybe in your methods, you say, I used this tool to conduct this analysis. Um, is it going to be in your results? Is it going to be in the discussion? Like where are you going to mention that you're using um, AI? Uh, are there ethical and privacy concerns, especially if you're dealing if you're dealing with participant data, uh, if you're dealing with people, how are you going to protect them? How are you going to store it, anonymize it? Uh, we've had questions in the past from people who wanted to use ChatGPT to analyze interviews, um, which they cannot do. <laughs> as we discovered from our research ethics board, um, because Chad GPT then, you know, will keep your input to train itself. Um, so it's not secure and you could potentially leak information about your participants. Even if your study is anonymous, if your participant um, unintentionally said something about themselves that identifies them, um, it's also very easy to go back and identify people. Like it does not take a lot of identifiers. Sometimes it's only two. 
Um, so in that case, we really want to use like Miguel vetted tools. So something to think about, especially if we deal with participant data or sensitive data. Um, do you have permission to use it? Right? Is it available online? Um, is it something proprietary? Is it something you subscribe to? Um, how, again, how are you going to acknowledge it? Are you going to put it in the citations? Um, I mean, at least you should put it in the citations, especially if you say get, um, if you get an image, well, you should definitely say that you're not the author. Um, how you do that may differ from citation style to citation style, but definitely make sure that you acknowledge the use of the tool. Um, anything that's not 100% yours, essentially. Um, this is very important for science, especially. Will your study be reproducible? Will your results be reproducible, right? Um, again, if it's something that you have to pay access for, like that's a barrier for other people to reproduce your study, they may not be able to. Also, a lot of these tools are kind of tailored to us, right? Because they learn from our profile. So when I use ChatGPT and ask it questions, it's going to try to predict the answer that I want. For you, it might be a completely different answer. So if someone's trying to um, reproduce your study, are they going to get completely different results, right? We're seeing some tools now that are kind of like thinking about that and either having um, like people's answers, like there's features you can choose to like not have it be part of the training data or not have it like specifically keyed to you. Um, but that's a very valid concern. Like, is it always going to give you the same results? Um, and are your results going to be valid? Um, again, who's the AI available to? Is it open access? Is it proprietary? Um, if it's proprietary, like what are they doing with the data that's in it. Um, so it's very important to be aware of that. Um, and what's the level of oversight and verification? Again, is it overseen by a private company? Is it overseen by the government? We're seeing now um, countries and governments putting in place more and more rigorous um, legislation with regard to AI, very often in terms of like privacy. Um, but something to keep in mind, like what's the oversight of this tool? Um, what has it been trained on? Uh, what could be the implications for, for my data or my results if I put them, if I put them into this tool? So just, you know, questions to think about. And this will change depending on your data, your research project, what your output is, but just good questions to keep in mind as you're working through projects. Um, and again, will also depend on the tool you're using, right? The implications will be very different if you're using ResearchRabbit, hopefully in conjunction with other tools. Um, and this is what I pointed to in the chat. We always try to search more than one place, right? And verify our, our results um, and be critical about what we're reading. So if I'm using it as part of one tool amongst many to do a live review, the implications are very different than I'm using it to not analyze my data to produce my results, right? Like it's going to be it's going to be quite different um, implications and how I'm going to actually um, mention that I'm using it. Okay, um, so what we're trying to build, and this workshop is kind of part of that, um, is kind of a framework for AI for the future. So um, Amanda and I do a lot of work on this. Um, but it starts with kind of like the basic principles that are going to be outlined here. Um, really begins with kind of being AI literate. So we did a little bit of that uh, at the beginning, trying to understand the different terms and, and words related to it. But um, it really requires a commitment to keeping up with kind of like the technology and the advancements and maybe the policies around it. Um, there's a lot of news stories. So being able to parse those out. Um, critically evaluating and participating in the discourse on these technologies, which, you know, you're all here today, so you're actively doing. Um, not just read about AI, but also experiment with the technologies. So like really becoming active and, and testing them out, right? Like, so maybe going out there and testing Research Rabbit or using Semantic Scholar to see um, how it works for us. Um, finding ways to integrate these in your research and workflows. Again, if it makes sense, and I would just you know, at which point it makes sense, 
um, but mostly always evaluating and interrogating AI, um, reviewing its position in our life and our research, right? So very much being critical about it, not just accepting it, not just saying, no, this is not for me, or yes, I love everything about it, but, you know, having an active um, kind of discourse and evaluation of, of the tools that are coming out and what, they, what they're doing, ultimately. Okay. So in conclusion, um, advances in AI will able, enable us to discover, conduct, and disseminate research. So different tools will enable us to do different stages of the research project. Um, again, always think about how you're going to acknowledge the use of AI, um, because you definitely want to mention it. And like I said, keep an eye out because some journals will not accept it as an author. Um, so you have to like be very clear as to like, if you use the tool, what you used it for, right? Like it wasn't for authorship. It was for this particular part of my project. Um, and it really starts with being AI literate. Um, critically evaluating these technologies and the information about them, um, and thinking about the possibilities of integrate, integrating it um, in our research workflows. All right, so do you have any questions? I think that's pretty much it for us today, but if you have any questions, I just thought, too, while people are thinking of questions, um, I had skipped over this for time, but one thing that uh, we also like to bring up is Crossref. Um, so if you've ever had to use Turnitin, uh, just know that journals have a version of this called Similarity Check, where they're also running your papers for plagiarism. Um, so this uses machine learning and metadata. There's automatic processes where it can flag uh, content for plagiarism. The same conversation that we're seeing, seeing with schoolwork, we're also going to be seeing with journals as well. Uh, so in the slides later, we have a link to a tweet or an X, I don't know what we're calling individual tweets anymore, um, but a link to a thread <laughs> where uh, you can see an instance where somebody was actually desk rejected at a journal uh, from an AI decision making where their work was uh, flagged for plagiarism when it actually wasn't plagiarized. Uh, so Sandy had also mentioned too, like, like um, in her AI acknowledgement plan, like uh, considering where like the oversight of these, these tools and who has access to this data and where it's kind of going. Uh, so something also to think about is when you're inputting your own work into these tools, if you were to ask chat GPT to proofread your work, you might be now assigning ownership over your work away. It could get fed into a lot of these machines and you could get flagged for plagiarizing your own content just for feeding it into to these kinds of things. Uh, so just something that we like to to recommend people check. I want to see a question there in the chat. Actually, I, would, yeah, I just want to make a point. Yes, that was exactly what I wanted to ask. Like how advanced are the journals and so on at figuring out whether it came from an AI source, the work that you're submitting is, is I, I'm guessing from what you're saying, they're pretty, they're pretty well advanced, right? There, I think it's the, the the same thing that we're seeing with with regular kind of academic content where they're not great at actually flagging things that are AI written versus uh, human written or plagiarized versus unplagiarized. I think that a lot of that is still um, still kind of up in the air. Uh, so there's lots of instances where things are getting incorrectly flagged for plagiarism when they're not. Uh, so it's definitely not foolproof. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amanda and Sandy, for that really wonderful and timely uh, presentation. Are uh, there any other questions? Uh, um, I'm seeing someone in the chat asking if you're using AI just for checking something or learning basic information about something or idea, do you need to report it? Well, I would think of it a little bit like when you're citing something, um, like you don't necessarily cite things that are general knowledge, right? Um, like, you know, uh, if you're doing cancer research, like the, the first person who did their presentation, um, they might not need to mention that an osteoblast is like bone cancer, right? Cause it's like understood in the field. So if you're looking that up, um, it's considered general in information. So like general knowledge. So in regular terms, you would not have to cite that. Um, I would say if it's more than that, then you would you would want to cite it. 
And I'll say too that we've put together a guide um, that has a couple different examples for how to cite um, generative AI using APA, Chicago, and MLA. Those are some of the ones that have come out with a little bit of guidance, but as Sandy was saying, it's not really widespread. A lot of uh, these different bodies haven't come out with like foolproof kind of uh, methods. Um, we also have in this same section too, a link to that AI plan that Sandy was going over. Um, so if you're looking for, for access to those as well, we've got a lot of that documented. So Amanda, uh, thank you for this, uh, Sandy, for the, uh, this uh, great uh, presentation. My question, do you have workshop like the other workshop in the library for that, for using uh, uh, AI or uh, uh, tools? Yeah, we do. Um, our next session is actually on February 6th, I believe. Um, and you can see, and there's not just AI, there's um, kind of AI and beyond. We've got a lot of different uh, workshops coming up. I'll put in the link our, our workshops page. Sandy and I are, I believe it's, if I go February 6th, oh, no. Oh, we're missing from here. We do have a session coming up. <laughs> It's in there somewhere, but um, if we scroll to Digital Scholarship Hub, that might be easier to do. I'm going to go five months. Oh. Here we go. Monthly view. Sorry, I was doing the wrong view there. That's my fault. AI, yeah, February 6th, AI tools for research. We are scheduled. I don't even know how to work my own calendar. I apologize to people. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of really cool stuff coming up, especially the week of February 12th. This is Love Data Week. Uh, so there's going to be things in there that are AI related. There's uh, where we're not necessarily labeling them AI, but they're definitely relevant to the conversation. So if you're really interested in the workshops that are being offered by the library, uh, this is a really great week to get involved. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing a question in the chat too. Like if you upload your own written work into ChatGPT just to proofread or check spelling or grammar, does that mean it's plagiarized too? To what extent can we use it? Um, I'd say it depends, right? It also depends like in your program, um, would they allow, for example, if you um, like if you hired someone to edit your papers, right? Um, so a little bit like that, but what can be sometimes tricky is that a lot of these tools, unless you opt out and there is a, like voluntarily opt out feature like chat gpt what like the input like what you put in it owns so it now owns your text um and then i mean i'm not saying that it's going to then give it to someone else but it can use it to, to train itself and give people answers so you may not want to do that because you don't want to lose the rights to your own text right so just something to be um, very careful with is some of those tools they like what the answer they give you is yours but what you put in to get the answer belongs to them right um, so if it's your own work I would just be really careful with that it's not a need to report the use of AI based uh, ones like Grammarly to journals um, I haven't seen anything specific to like Grammarly. Have you, Sandy? I no, we did I get a pop up. Sandy and I we recently submitted a paper, and it asked us to declare whether or not we had an AI author, and that also AI authors were not acceptable and whatnot. So it was like it was a big glaring pop up right in the center of the page. So they're yeah. definitely on top of those things. Yeah. So they they seem to me more concerned if the tool wrote a piece of your paper. Not if it's checking your grammar or not like, um, you know, sometimes if you're in um, like the online version of Word, like when you're writing a sentence, it tries to like autocomplete it for you. Um, I don't think they care about that. They're more concerned about like, did you actually use ChatGPT to tell it, write me a paper about breast cancer <laughs> and then it gave you an answer, right? Um, that seems to be so far what they're more concerned with, but, you know, it could change. 
Um, and someone was just asking like an application, like Crossref or, or perhaps like Turnitin or your kind or something like that. Um, you could try doing like an individual subscription if you were to use one, but there isn't um, anything that like McGill uses, like, like the like software provided by McGill, right, Sandy? No, not that I know of, no. All right. <laughs> That's uh, really interesting. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for attending our first of the year uh, seminar. And uh, we hope uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know where to go. Uh, Amanda and Sandy can help you out. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks to you all for coming. And thanks again for agreeing uh, to present. Yeah, it was very, it was wonderful. I, I learned quite a bit. Well, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.